Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, thank you for organizing this um, LoRa convention. Um, I'm um, talking about LoRa modulation today, uh, which is the only somewhat theoretical presentation. Um, everything else, and I'm quite happy to see that, is on uh, applied things, how to use it. But still, I think that it pays off to understand a little bit how it works, why it works, what um, the strong aspects of LoRa are, and this is why I'm here to show you a little bit of that. During the introduction, um, Andreas, you mentioned that I will be telling you everything about LoRa modulation. That's actually not true. But I'll try to show you a few interesting aspects of this. So first of all, a little bit about myself. My name is Matt. I'm a senior lecturer at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences, and I teach physics, uh, electromagnetic theory, introductions to electronics, things like that. But my background is actually in computer science. I'm a computer scientist uh, by training, but everything I did in the past during my academic career and also while I was working in the industry were applied things. So applying computer science to lab robots, to medical problems, to things like that. And this is a bit um, what I really enjoy doing. And when it comes to amateur radio, I did some, some training in electronics. I'm not an electronics engineer, but um, I enjoyed it a lot. And when I was done with that, I learned that uh, there was a way to get into uh, RF electronics uh, with amateur radio, so I did that. I got licensed a bit more than 10 years ago, and I had a very wild ride uh, during the past 10 years. I enjoyed this a lot. And I did learn a lot, and I'm here to share a little bit um, of what I learned, although I'm not an expert. So this is about me. What are the goals of this presentation? The goal is to understand, to some extent, LoRa modulation. Not all the details of it, but to have some understanding of what chips are and how to work with them. Uh, and the motivation for that is, first of all, because I'm a curious person. I like to understand the things that I use especially when I think with them. And also understanding this potentially gives us the opportunity to improve on it. There is a number of things that could be done that are not supported by this uh, actually proprietary technology. And um, I could imagine, uh, this is actually also happening already, uh, that, that um, by understanding how it works, we could extend this work. For example, with receivers that allow the reception of multiple LoRa packets simultaneously and things like that. What this presentation actually is not about is the goal is not to be super scientific. Um, I'm a scientist, that is true, but um, I'm here to give a kind of a low level um, presentation on this. Um, and everything I'll show is not super efficient, it's not. Um, exploiting one of the key properties of LoRa, which is this energy efficiency being low on, on energy consumption. So this is about understanding how it works and not about exploiting this. And some of the techniques are actually not the best ways to do that, arguably. Um, so there's that. There's multiple open source implementations of LoRa modulators and demodulators. If this is your thing, then here is a paper where you can read about how to do this better. There is actually a number of such implementations and everyone is, is releasing a paper where they claim that their implementation is the best compared to the others. Um, so you can, you can read about that here. So let's talk about chips for a second. If you look at chips, this is the basic, basic, basis of, of LoRa modulations, as I'm sure you're aware of. Chips are signals that change in frequency when time evolves. In the time domain, this is a time axis here. In the time of domain, we can observe here a chirp that ch starts at, at a low frequency, and then the frequency keeps increasing. So this would be in the time domain. This is one chip that starts at a low frequency and then goes up in frequency. In the frequency domain, this is a, a um, it's actually called spectrogram with the horizontal time axis and the vertical frequency axis. We can see how the frequency starts at 
maybe 450 kilohertz and then reaches a uh, bit less than 600 and then the chip is over and the next chip starts. So this is, basic, this is the basis of LoRa. Now we'll talk a bit of, about why this is a, a good thing or let's say about the advantages of that, but that's the essence. You can also observe that down chips exist that start at a high frequency and reach a lower frequency, it's called down chip. And then um, if you look closely, you see that it's not always starting sort of at the same frequency, which is a fundamental aspect of how this all works. And usually when someone has a presentation on LoRa modulation, this is where it ends, right? So we have chirps and chirps are great for whatever reason and that's it. Um, but we want to have a bit of a deeper dive in this and for, for that we need to understand a bit uh, of the term terminology that is typically used um, when discussing these things. So on the left in this slide you can observe something that called frequency shift keying is a way of transmitting two symbols, one at a low frequency here at the left, for some reason this is not showing up in color here, and then a higher uh, another symbol at a higher frequency right after So this would be low frequency, high frequency, low frequency, high frequency. There's many uh, applications for this. I'm sure you know some of them, um, but basically this is using two symbols to encode two bits in a way. So, so there's that. This idea can be extended to more symbols. So on the right, and I'm happy that this actually does show up in color, we have a low frequency in the beginning in bright red and then a higher frequency right after that in dark red and then even a higher frequency in black and then a super high frequency at the end in blue. So again, we are encoding information here, but we do this with four symbols. And these four symbols, they map to something called die bit, which is a combination of two bits, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, right? So this is how we can um, transmit information by encoding information that is present originally in bits and bytes into symbols, and this is what we then transmit somehow. Frequency um, shift keying um, is called like that because you shift the frequency depending on the symbol that you want to transmit. And you do this at some rate. For example, here, the duration of one symbol is whatever that is. It's not a super scientific presentation, which is why we don't have labels on these axes, right? But this is um, the duration for one symbol. And the symbol rate at the right is actually the same. We have the same number of symbols per time. I actually see um, people taking pictures of my slides. You can have these slides, of course, at the end, right? So I'm happy if you do that, but I would very much offer you the slides. Um, so the number of bits that we transmit is higher in this case, because compared to the case in the left with binary frequency shift keying, we uh, have the same symbol rate, but we encode more bits per symbol. So, um, so there is this notion of bit rate and symbol rate that is not necessarily the same. So this is the first thing I wanted to introduce. Then um, there is something called spreading factor, which is depending on the actual application of spread spectrum, not always the same thing. In LoRa, um, the spreading factor affects the number of symbols that you can have. I call this capital N, sometimes it's called capital N, whatever. So if you have a spreading factor of seven, you can compute the number of symbols that are available by calculating two to the power of seven, which would be 128, right? If we have a, a spreading factor of two, that would give us two to the power of two, which is actually four, four different symbols, zero, one, two, and three. This is um, just a way to explain how many symbols we have. And we can already observe here, this is an example of a LoRa packet. There's a preamble, yada, yada, yada. And then there is symbols that are being transmitted. And the actual symbol um, is identified by at what frequency it starts. 
So this starts at the very top, it's a down here, so um, this would be mapped to symbol number zero. This starts at the center, so it's not the same symbol, but a different symbol. Um, with an example of a spreading factor of two, you can see this quite nicely. Going back to the slide before, it's the same idea we had here before FSK, but we're not using a fixed frequency to transmit this, but we're using chirps. So we need a way to go back and forth between the two, and I'll introduce that in a second. But before we do that, I would like to mention that uh, one of the strong aspects of LoRa is that if we have an interference somewhere at the frequency, it would affect our transmit transfer of information much less than um, if we were operating at that fixed frequency, because the chirp is transitioning through a region where we have interference, and that's of course not great, but everything else is not affected. So if we have local interference, that already helps a lot to spread the information uh, over a certain amount of bandwidth. So there is that. If you increase the spreading factor, you're able to transmit more symbols um, uh, per, uh, per chirp, um, but the chirp also takes longer. So this in the end actually evens out. But you also have the ability to increase the bandwidth. If you've tinkered around with LoRa, you know that there is a way to define the bandwidth, maybe 125 kilohertz, maybe more. And of course, the chirp will cover more and more bandwidth as you increase that bandwidth setting. So for 500 kilohertz, you will be covering um, approximately 500 kilohertz with 125 kilohertz, it will be less. Note that we also change the spreading factor here um, to be able to show this comparatively. So there is that. In case you have questions, be free to, um, to ask them whenever you feel like. I have to check on my time, but I'm doing well. Um, so, so these are sort of the basics. To summarize this, we can observe a LoRa packet. This is actually, a, this is a real packet that was generated by, um, I should mention this actually, this is an excellent technical report on how this all works. And I took a lot of um, pictures from that report, along with some others that are always referenced here. And if you want to learn more about all that, this is the way to go. Because this is explained very well, it's explained in a way that is relatively easy to understand, so this is really worth a read. So to summarize this, every LoRa packet starts with uh, a preamble, which is just a bunch of up chirps, and then there is two special symbols, um, and then there is 2.25 down chirps. These are all up chirps, and then there is 2.25 down chirps. This is to kind of align um, the decoding frame um, to be sure that you always, because if you were um, attempting to decode, for example, from here to here, it would be wrong. So you have to do that somehow. You always have to do that. Um, and LoRa has kind of a special way to do that with these 2.25 down chirp symbols. I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but it's there. Um, and then after that, we have data. Um, another thing I would like to touch upon is um, LoRa is supposed to be resilient against multipath fading, right? So um, why is that? Um, and there is actually an interesting reason why that is. If you, um, if you consider um, two signals that are in phase, so imagine you have one transmitter, one receiver, but the electromagnetic waves propagate in a way that um, covers maybe two lines that merge back at the receiver, and these are completely in phase, then you don't have a problem. You actually have twice the, the signal, which is great. Um, they could be, the, the amplitude in this is wrong. So this would be um, signal one, signal two, and the superposition of the two. Um, which would be double in that case, because you're just adding um, two sine waves here. If it's a bit out of phase, there is no loss and no gain. You basically um, end up with the same. There is a shift in phase, 
Um, but it's also possible this light is for some reason completely wrong. So this should be 100 degrees out of phase. And I'm sure we all know that, right? When signals um, arrive 100 degrees out of phase, they cancel out completely. And that's not great because the signal would be there. It's just that there is another signal of the, of the same uh, amplitude, but um, out of phase that cancel out your signal. Five minutes, great. Um, so so that, um, that is not what we want. And if we spread this um, over um, a bunch of frequencies, over a certain bandwidth, then this only occurs at one particular frequency because frequency and wavelength is related to each other and the phase shift is a function of the wavelength. So, so there is that. Um, so this is actually why LoRa modulation is somewhat so quite resilient to, um, to multipath fading. So for the remaining five minutes, let's try this a little bit. Um, there is a bunch of theory. Um, who's familiar with complex sinusoid, complex sinusoids in SDR? Few people. Okay, great. So um, this is the point to plug another class that I have because I have a class where we discuss this in quite some detail. But the gist of all this is um, if you have um, two signals and you multiply them in digital signal processing, you end up with a resulting signal um, that contains um, a bunch of output signals. And depending on whether do you do this in the real domain or in the complex domain, it's it's kind of different, but what you can do is you have, if you receive an up chirp from your antenna in your SDR receiver um, and you generate a reference down chirp and you mix the two, then they, they cancel out and the product is like um, on a fixed frequency. If you do the same with an input up chirp um, that is shifted in frequency, for another symbol, for example, then you again, you get a product that is constant in frequency, but at a different frequency. So this is a way to convert these chirps to FSK, and then we can use all the FSK theory that we have um, to, to demodulate. So, um, because I want it to be, this to be a somewhat applied um, presentation after, the, after all, I tried that. I generated using this very cool um, GNU radio um, suit. I generated a LoRa packet or a bunch of them actually. I stored them in a file and I can display them. So these are four LoRa packets here in the time domain at the top, in the frequency domain at the bottom. Again, if this was a scientific presentation, there would be labels of access, but I think we can we can manage. Um, so I load these data and then I plot them. I can also zoom in because there is not much to see here. So if I zoom into one packet, it looks like that. I can zoom into the time domain. I can see my complex signals that actually um, change in phase um, and in frequency because it's a chirp. So that's not super important, but what is important to me is that I can display this. Um, what I can also do is I can resample because I actually only need 125 kilohertz. Um, so I can resample and this gives me just that section of, of the portion. Then I can generate a lot of down chirps and I can multiply the two. And this gives me actually constant frequencies that I can clean up and then I can just measure where they are and this will give me the symbols and that's it. Um, so this is, in a nutshell, I'm happy to discuss in much more detail, but in a nutshell, this is how you could do this. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm open for questions.